Oh, yeah. We are back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number. John King is right over there. I'm Peter Christian, and we'll say thanks again to Jim Adair. By the way, Brandy called just as he left. She wanted to go on and talk, oh, about, did talk she? about the slide. I, was, I, I bet she was going to inform us all that the slide was actually his idea. And yeah, anyway. But we have, we have a, we, we're, we're shifting gears now, and uh, we, we love having candidates in the studio, no matter what office they're running for. And this is a big one. Uh, Thomas Breck is joining us here in the studio. And uh, you uh, have embarked, if you will, on, on a great adventure, uh, trying to get your name included in the ballot uh, for the congressional race, what they're calling the special federal election, uh, to replace Ryan Zinke, who is now the Secretary of the Interior. So far, there are three people on that ballot, and you'd like it to be four, right? Well, actually, um, there's two gentlemen, or me, myself and another one, included on the lawsuit with the state uh, to try to gain uh, ballot access. Um, and he's an independent candidate. I'm a minor party candidate. Um, and our our grievance with the state is that we weren't given enough time to um, get the signatures needed to get on the ballot. And we, as minor and independent party candidates, should not have to jump through tremendous hoops and then ultimately be denied because we were unable to jump through all those hoops to participate in our democracy. So uh, people are hearing this argument and they're saying, well, it looks like the Libertarian Party did it. They overcame the odds. What makes your party different? Why don't you have – why should you have different standards than the Libertarian Party? Well, we did have party status um, at once and it, it, uh, it, it went away because of lack of involvement um, – and, you know, I'm a student at the University of Montana. I'm a political scientist. And I shouldn't have to jump through any extra hoops to participate in my democracy. I shouldn't have to uh, get nearly 15,000 signatures of Montanans to represent my friends and neighbors um, in this great experimental democracy we have. But you think everybody should have some hoops, right? I mean, you have to pay a filing fee. There's paperwork. I mean, to be on the up and up, we need to have background checks and, and make sure that people are, you know, fair, that you're Montana, that you're from Montana. I mean, there's certain hoops that we all agree, I think, no matter what party you're from, probably, unless you're from the anarchist party, that we, <laughs> that, that we should have, right? So at what point do you think it's unfair or unreasonable? Well, 14,000 signatures in a matter of days is certainly not fair. I mean, we can argue about whether or not the, there should be a filing fee and all the bureaucratic steps but those are outside of me having to convince 15,000 Montanans to sign their name for me to become a, a a candidate and then especially if those signatures are required to come within just a matter of days right now let let's talk for a moment about about the green party and what you represent are you wearing a t-shirt it says people planet and peace over profit vote Jill Stein okay and she was the presidential candidate yes she was so 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 tell me how you got involved in all this well, I mean, um, up until 08, I was a carpenter uh, for nearly 17 years. Um, my dad was a carpenter. Um, I became a displaced worker and um, went to college in my 30s, which uh, comes with its own set of weights, but its own set of benefits as well. Um, and you have three kids, too. I do have three, what, what three kids, a high schooler, middle schooler, elementary school. Wow. Um, um, all three daughters, all three redheads. <laughs> so I got my hands full at home for sure. Um but I came back to school um, in 08 when the economy went flat and didn't really know what I wanted to do. I bounced around from you know, several degrees, business, journalism, um, ended up finding political science and fell in love and became politically engaged and active uh, during the Bernie primary race. Um, I was a Bernie delegate at the state convention, and I watched the process rules be changed before my very eyes and all the people like me who were there – with all this energy and, and, and enthusiasm for our candidate, we were very much marginalized uh, from the, the get-go. And after, after now, leaving hold, the hold, – hold, hold on a second. How, how, how did that marginalization take place? Because like, like I say, we weren't there, and you, and you were there in the midst of all this. So what exactly happened that made you feel marginalized? Well, um, the way the process was supposed to – the rules were written for the process was um, as a Democratic precinct committee member, I was supposed to be shown favoritism as well as all other precinct committee members. Anyone holding uh, an elected office was supposed to be showed favoritism. Um, and after the first round of voting, the way it was supposed to work was there was three rounds of voting and all of – everybody, all the Democrat precinct committee members, all the delegates who were appointed were uh, supposed to have equal opportunity 
to compete or, or be selected by the, the group uh, to go to Philadelphia to represent Bernie Sanders in the primary or in the convention. And after the first round of voting, they purged 80% of the names off the list, essentially whittled the names down to 10 people and then worked. Well, real quick, sorry. Who is they? Uh, that's, party that's, officials, the, the party officials, those those running the show, both the, on, the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party officials, but Montana people, Montana Democratic uh, officials. But of course, the the local Democratic uh, officials take their marching orders from up top. You know, they are a top down um, political organization, whereas the Green Party is a bottom up. Um, we at the local level tell the national what to do. Not the national telling the people at the bottom what to do. So let me ask you this, though. You you were a Bernie Sanders supporter, mm-hmm. not a Jill Stein supporter in the primary. In the primary, true. Okay, okay. True. So, but you, you went from the, the Democratic Party to the Green Party after I this did. The very next day after the convention. So I guess my question for you is, have you given up hope on the Democratic Party after this Bernie Sanders thing and are now a Green Party all the way kind of guy? Or – if someone like Bernie Sanders were to come back up into the ranks of the of the Democratic Party, would you would you flip back? Well, at this point, I see no hope for the Democratic Party. If an amazing man with a long history and a long track record of doing the right thing, if a man like Bernie Sanders can't move the party left, I don't believe anyone can. Um, I don't believe that there's going to be anyone like Bernie Sanders. Does the party need to be moved to the left? Well, if we in your, cons- in your opinion, if we consider that Eisenhower was a centrist, moderate Republican, and he is far left on any of the issues today than our most liberal members of Congress or the Senate. Um, in the last 30 years, we have seen us move so far right that Ronald Reagan, a admitted Reagan, God, a Republican God, is too liberal to obtain the primary nomination amongst their party. So that gives you a sense of how far right we've moved. Um, and that mindset that we can pull the party left is how we've been pulled right. Now, as upsetting as I'm sure it was for Bernie Sanders supporters to see him fail, he got pretty close. He did. And I'll be honest, I don't think a Green Party candidate will likely get as close as Bernie Sanders did. you got to say, you know, the percentage of actually achieving your mission here, um, maybe it, it would be with the Democratic Party. Because you know, uh, that's not think- that's not possible because you cannot have a revolution in a counter revolutionary party, um, and, and and you know perhaps previous to Trump winning the election, that was a true statement, but the political scene in America has changed dramatically in the last couple of months with the election of Donald Trump, and uh, you know we stand for people, planet, and peace, and those are just now really gaining in popularity amongst the average citizen um and i think that with the attacks and the threats to the epa uh pipeline approvals the keystone xl which the majority of americans are standing in opposition to uh let alone montanans who are you know actually have their water put in at, at, at jeopardy for this pipeline uh we're, we're, we're up against a break so hang on we're going to have you till 10 so hang on fantastic <laughs> hang on to the passion also we have dave on the line and we have th- three other lines open at seven two one twelve ninety. Our guest is Thomas Breck, Green Party candidate for Congress. He wants to be on the ballot, and we'll be right back. Okay, we're back on Talk Back, and uh, Thomas Breck joining us. Uh, he's a Green Party candidate for Congress, and I want to get a couple of calls on in the short time that we have uh, during this period. So, Dave, you're up first. Hi, you're on with Thomas Breck. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. I was wondering, hello? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Oh, thank you. I was wondering, you know, I keep seeing... You know, all of our trickle down, you know, government, and everybody keeps promises, promises, everything. And so there's eight cents that you want on the gallon, and everything else, our streets in Missoula are screwed up, and, you know, our marriage just seems to, you know, where every $100 million needs to be spent. Where does it stop? You guys never seem to. Everybody gets a paycheck but us. Okay. Thank well, you. Thanks for the call. So, what, what do you think about all the spending and uh, the unending taxation, especially here in Missoula? Well, you know, I mean, it's it's really kind of unfortunate in Montana that all um, infrastructure costs um, are carried by the property owner. Um, you know, no one likes the idea of a gas tax, but uh, you know, we have millions of people come to our state every year. 
and that puts a lot of wear and tear on our roads, our bridges, and our state infrastructure. And then we expect our property owners to be the sole bearer of that burden, and that simply is not sustainable. Um, I don't know what would be the best solution. Um, you know, we, we don't have a sales tax, and these problems are why states implement sales tax because infrastructure costs, um, and it's unfair to expect property owners to carry all that weight. Um, but we certainly do need to address the the this mindset that somehow uh, we 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 should make every uh, property owner pay, and then somehow not worry about collecting from tourists who come in and are truly the the driver of some of these wares. Um, literally, literally, the driver of these yeah. wares. So so we we are up against our heartbreak now. So I'm going to ask Al, Al, if you don't mind, I apologize for making you wait. We got to take a, a, a hard break here at the top of the hour. But uh, Thomas Brecker is going to be with us all the way through the 9 o'clock hour, so you'll be the first one up when we come back after the, uh, after the 9 o'clock news. So, Al and Jason, if you guys will hang on, we'll get you on uh, after the break. So stay with us. We'll be back. Welcome back, everybody. It's hour number two of Talk Back for this Wednesday, brought to you by Bulls Eyewear, Selway Armory, Dig It Excavating, and First Montana Bank. I'm Peter Christian. That's uh, John King. Joining, uh, joining us in the studio is Thomas Breck. He is a Green Party candidate, hoping to be on the congressional ballot eventually. Uh, we'll right. get, but, but we have callers who've been waiting all the way through the break, so let's get to them first. Uh, Al, thank you for holding, sir. You are on with Thomas Breck. Go ahead. Well, thank you. I just wanted to ask Tom a question. Uh, what were your thoughts when uh, John Podesta's uh, emails became uh, public? that showed several questions on their uh, Donna Brazil, who later became the DNC. At the time, she was a CNN correspondent. She emailed John Podesta several questions that were asked on the Hillary-Bernie debate. One of them was word for word. What were your thoughts when you learned about this? Okay, thanks for the call, Al. So what do you think? Um, You know, honestly, it was just one of many uh, dirty tricks I saw uh, taken place by the Democratic National Party. Did did that surprise you that that, that the party that you were a part of, that you you had passion for, would do that sort of thing? It it, it not only surprised me, it kind of devastated me to a a core and fundamental way because, you know, I I had believed in all of these party ideals – um, and, and believed that they actually applied and um, took it for granted until I became an active member of the party and then watched the shady behavior and closed door deals that, that took place. It's like making sausage, right? It's true. It's yeah. true. And, and so it just it, it led me to see the Democratic Party as as corrupt as Republicans um, in, in many ways, you know, certainly in their own way. But the level of corruption to me seemed to be on par with what I'd seen in the Republican Party. Um, and that's not what the American people deserve. And I think that this recent um, election of Donald Trump is a prime example of that kind of um, disenfranchisement by the average voter. Um, they stayed home. You know, we had a we had millions of Americans not turn out to vote. And that's what allowed Donald Trump to win. Um, his people showed up in greater numbers and and. In, well, that, that that's the point of anyone who's running for office is to get your constituency to turn out. So let, let's let's get back to the phone. Jason, you are on with Thomas Breck. Go ahead. Yeah. So we talked about taxes here just a couple of minutes ago. Um, one of the things that I'm I think would alleviate some of the taxes is if we took some of our federal lands back uh, as state owned, operated. There's millions of dollars generated. The federal government does a very poor job of maintaining some of those parks, Yellowstone in particular. I remember walking boardwalks that had holes in them. Um, so I guess I want to know what, what his opinion is on states' rights on taking federal lands back into their um, own coffers, I guess. Okay, so so pu- public hands and uh, public lands and public hands, that's the that's the phrase seems to be. This yeah, these I, I would love to see public lands in the hands of the public, um, but my fear is that we would see – um, exploitation and pollution of those lands. Um, I, I'd love to see them stay as pristine as possible for my children and my children's children. So when see, when you say that, you say that with a government run by a Donald Trump, an executive branch, you trust him more than a Montanan. 
No, I'm not saying that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying you that. You kind of no, are. No. Well, I mean, I would, I would have – well, there is this, this fight to uh, control public lands, and the federal government hasn't done a really great job at that thus far. Um, that, which is our caller's point. It's so true. Why, but why, I don't why know do, why we, do you think why do you think that the states would be so much worse? I don't know that they would be. Um, so but if we do been, see state legislators being easier to buy than federal offices because uh, you know we we truly I mean, it doesn't take a lot of money. So Alec is a uh, Koch brothers political organization that basically writes laws and then gets senators and gov- uh, congressmen to to sign off on these laws that have been pre written by you know, large legal teams. Um, sure. They're looking to expand that model into the state legislators to go small scale rather than macro scale. Well, they already have that. I mean, state legislatures use ALEC bills all the time. Absolutely. And, and then there's other types of bill factories that people use as well besides um, ALEC. And, and that's my fear is that if you can come in. But, but and, having a bill factory, an idea, uh, an idea machine where people from around the country share their ideas on what works or what they think should work in their states. I mean, I don't find that to be particularly uh, abhorrent. And I would say that if you're going to buy a politician, it's a lot easier when you got fish in a barrel, i.e. Washington, D.C., than when they're spread out across all 50 states. It's a lot easier to get in there and bribe and get your money where it wants to be than when you have to go to people individually far, far away. You want to go to Helena? Yeah. Where the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, it seems to me you have to put a lot more of your morals at the door to get entry into Washington, D.C., than you do to get into hell. You know, the, the case example I would use is, you know, if we look at the Standing Rock battle uh, in North Dakota, you know, these are sovereign people on sovereign land. And the state is uh, become a mechanism of corporations to exploit oil from or rather to transport oil across these lands and put uh, the head of the Missouri River, the headwaters of the Missouri River at risk. And you're arguing that the state, the same state you're criticizing here, should have more power over Montana public lands. No, no, I don't know what the answer is. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to upset anything at this point unless we can ensure that the lands will be protected and uh, maintained for future generations. Um, you know, I do think that the states would be a better control over the their their lands than the federal government. So you'd be okay with the states taking more ownership and leadership of public lands if there was some kind of guarantee that they weren't going to be exploited, mined, oiled. Um, disturbed and ruined for future generations. Well, My yeah. concern is only about maintaining the land in its good a shape as possible. Whatever condition it is right now, we need to protect that so that our future generations have it to enjoy as well. Are you are you familiar with Jennifer Fielder? And uh, she's a, a, a Montana legislator. Legislator. She's out of uh, Mineral County, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. I'm and she, she has been a champion of trying to uh, trying to take some, not all, but some public lands. And t- transferring them to state control simply because the state, the people who are right here, we're not talking about selling them to the highest bidder. I hate that phrase. That is a hackneyed, horrible phrase, selling them to the highest bidder. Who sells it to the highest bidder? The U.S. government does. It's but, true. But, but anyway, true. I mean, uh, it, it is, uh, I, I think, it, sometimes I'm really in tune with, with Jennifer, with, with the things that she says about the states can do it better Yes, it may it, it, it may cost more money, and it may be kind of difficult to to initiate. But I think in the long run, having control right here in Montana of Montana lands, I think would be a good thing. I do too, and, and I certainly would agree with the people having um, say over over the, the that process and the rules that govern that land. Um, at this point, with the federal government, we have no say, you know, and that that is a big concern for the average person because if Trump decides that he wants to allow a mining company to come in and mine federal lands, it doesn't. We have no real way of saying no. We don't want this, um, and so I, I mean, I would I would have the states be in control, but only if we can have some kind of safeguards to guarantee that it's not going to. No, the first couple paragraphs of the Montana Constitution do address that, right? Yeah, I mean, they address the th- your concerns. It sounds to me, if, if you read them, it talks about um, preserving the. The earth and the air and the water for future generations, things like that. And I don't remember the uh, Constitution verbatim from that, that. That's already in there. And we're up against a break. So we I'll have, look it up. But we, we have John and Dave. Both want to visit with you. Thomas Breck is our guest. He's a Green Party candidate. He wants to be on the ballot for the con- a congressional election coming up in May. Love to have your phone calls and questions. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back on Talk Back. 721-1290 is our number. 
1-800-568-5309. And uh, you can also make your comments on our Facebook page if you'd like to, if the phones are full. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, before we get to callers, just real quick, I wanted to get a, a bit of a timeline. So it's my understanding that by April 10th, they need to have uh, some kind of decision on the mail-in ballot process. Otherwise, that, that won't happen. The mail-in only ballots is probably a better way to describe it. Uh, I guess my question for you is uh, the timeline must be pretty close for you to get on the ballot as well. So what does it look like for you? When are you, what, where are you, what is your deadline? Uh, we are in court um, April 4th in Great Falls. Um, and we are hoping that the, the courts will be um, expedient and uh, efficient at uh, determining a ruling in this case. Uh, now, does, does the court understand the timing issues here? Is I, that, was that why they agreed to hear this case so early? Um, I, I would imagine so. Um, I obviously, I don't know for sure one way or another, um, but I would imagine so. So you're at a district court? Yeah, a uh, federal district court in Great Falls. So if the state appeals, you go to the Ninth Circuit bog down court, mm-hmm. and then you go to the Supreme Court if it gets appealed <laughs> there. You think there's much chance that you get through that? Well, I'm a write-in candidate um, either way. We've been running a write-in candid- candid- um, candidacy from the start because we recognize that there is a chance that we wouldn't obtain our ballot access, and we figured that as long as we go with a write-in campaign, even if we don't get ballot access, if everybody's familiar with that as being the plan from day one, then it won't catch them by surprise if they come into the ballot box and they see that our, our name's not listed. Oh, gotcha. Now, just so we're, we all know, even for write-in candidates, there are hoops you got to jump through to get on the write-in campaign. So you've got those done. Yes. Okay, yes. gotcha. Less Here. the fee, which we're waiting to determine whether or not sure. you know, how it all plays out. Okay, let's get let's get uh, one of our callers on the line. Dave, you're on TalkBack. Go ahead. Good morning. How about jobs and the environment? A lot of people, you know, worry about jobs and, and believe that the uh, environment, the clean environment, is going to get in the way of those jobs. An example being clean coal, which is a myth. Uh, you're going to have, if you want coal, you're going to not going to have a clean a clean environment. What's your opinion on all of that? Okay, thanks, Dave. Well, you know. Um, there are sustainable technologies that we could be using to implement um, and, and help us. Uh, my biggest um, kind of idea uh, that would help us overcome this loss of jobs when we move from these more antiquated technologies and, and energy resources, we could easily grow hemp. We import billions of dollars worth of hemp from Canada every year for our auto industry. And why aren't we growing that ourselves? I mean, we, we, hemp can be grown across the country. We've grown it in times of war uh, to the millions of tons. We have, we have grown hemp in the past, and I don't understand why we're not doing it no. today. So are you saying that's a replacement energy industry um, for, it, like, coal? It, well, it, it, it's Talking jobs. I'm saying that it's, it's a revenue. It's a replacement for jobs. But, like, it's a small factor of the number of jobs that would be lost in all of our heavy industrial industries. We if you got rid of coal and natural gas and all this stuff altogether, well, I mean, we, we're not, there's no way that we're going to do away with something overnight. Um, we have needs as a society, and we need to recognize those needs, and we need to be at least working towards something better instead of refusing to implement new technologies to so, so, at least have a brighter, greener possibility on the you know future. What, what does that look like? So I was looking at the data this morning for 2015. Uh, energy um, uh, part of the federal government. They track how much our energy use and what we are using. They put 33% at coal, 33% at natural gas, 20% at hydro, and then everything else is under that last little, like, eight, 7 to 10%. So where do, where do you see the change happening that you want? Well, you know, I mean, Germany's doing away with nuclear power plants. They're replacing with wind and um, ocean uh, turbines that would create uh, energy. Um, there's a lot of technologies that we could be implementing um, and saving ourselves a lot of environmental woes. Uh, and the thing about it is, is a lot of these things, we don't actually experience a true environmental cost for them. Um, we don't, we, we really need to start um, implementing a plan that will allow us to move beyond this fossil fuel addiction that we have. Um, it, it, not a, we really just need to set up a plan um, and not let the industry in America alter that plan or uh, diminish our ability to control our own country and our own future. Um, that's the benefit of me. Um, the Green Party 
doesn't take corporate donations. I don't take corporate donations. Um, so when if I was to be fortunate enough to be elected to D.C., uh, my, temper, my, my position doesn't have to be tempered by a corporate donor um, uh, or a corporate master. I'm free to do the people's will. And the thing about it is, is a lot of these policies I'm talking about are very popular with the average person. Um, but we don't see them being affected in, in D.C. And that's because there's a disconnect between our representatives and our people. Okay, we're going to take a break right there. We have Roy, Jerry, and Bobby. They all want to visit with you. We have one line open. I'd like to visit with uh, Thomas Breck. Give us a call. We'll be right back. Talk back. Rolling right along on this Wednesday, and uh, we are privileged to have here in the studio with us Thomas Breck, uh, who is a candidate, green candidate uh, for the for Congress, and uh, we want to get all Green four- is in the Green Party, not as in new. I'm sorry. Yes. Right, Green Party. Green right. Party. Also, they include orange, my favorite color on their their logo. So which is I'm, I'm which happy is very cool. It looks it looks positively Irish, if you will. So let let's get uh, Roy on the line. Roy, thanks for holding. You're on with Thomas Breck. Go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Thomas, I have a question for you. Uh, from what I, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, you said that you're running as a part of the Democratic Party, and they wouldn't let you on the ballot. Uh, no, no, no. He's he's running as a Green Party candidate, and he was upset the way that the Democratic Party treated Bernie Sanders. And so he left the Democratic Party to join the oh, Green Party. Oh, okay. That's why he left the party. So you're running You're running as a separate party. Yes. Yeah, Green Party. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, okay. I understand. Well, uh, from what you've said so far... Uh, it seems to me I may be wrong, but you didn't you didn't go through the proper process and the proper time, and that's that's uh, you know that's required. And so uh, uh, why don't you just try it next time? Uh, the other thing, the other question I have: you say that you're uh, you're uh, want to help the people of Montana. I don't see where it helps the people of Montana if you take this to court, because either way, whether you win or lose, the people of Montana have to pay for it. So that's uh, okay, Roy. I'll hear your comments on that. Thanks for the call. So, what do you think? Um, well, first of all, it's not just me. You know, there's another plaintiff on the on the bill, and he is not uh, party affiliated, and it shouldn't be a prerequisite or a requirement to be part of a party to run for office in America. It's part of our constitution that every single person has a free and uh, equal opportunity for public uh, office, um, and the there should not be extra hurdles for us to jump through or to uh, to keep us from participating, and that's what we're fighting. We're fighting the bad rules that keep the average person from participating. I, I understand that you're fighting those rules, but we, we do live in a world where law is important, right? We, we want our laws to be followed. We don't want people to break the law, and we don't want that to be candidates or uh, the legal system itself. We want the law that is as written to be followed, and if it's incorrect, we want our legislators to change it so I guess my question for you is, what's wrong? Was the law broken to prevent you, or are you trying to circumnavigate the law? Um, well, the thing about it is, is laws are created in our country uh, two ways. One, they're written. Two, they're set by precedent in courts. This process is occurring at the exact way that the process was designed to work. This was always intended to be fought in court. That's the nature of the, the our country, our legal our law country, our, uh, based on laws, is laws are constantly being readjusted and challenged. And, and, challenged right. and those challenges have to occur in court. By the way, I said circumnavigate. That's for Magellan. Um, <laughs> circumvent, I think, is no, the word no, I was no, looking No, and I'm not there. looking to, you know, I, I'm acting completely within the law. And that's why we're going to court. Um, this just so happens to be the way the system is designed to, wa- uh, in, to operate. In legal issues, that's called the remedy. Exactly. So, so, so the you remedy, know. your remedy, is to go to court to get this right. That's because that's how we, All in right. a country of laws, let's, handle let's, things. But let's move on, Dean. You're on Talkback with uh, with Thomas uh, Breck. Go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, gentlemen. I was going to ask. You know, I live on a piece of property where the highway always runs through, and they continued. This is going to be the second time where. They're allowed to just, I guess, go ahead and take a piece of it, you know, the way the old railroad, railroad did. And why is that okay? Okay. So, so are are they are they claiming eminent domain, Dean? 
Yes, they are. They are. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll ask Thomas about that. What do you, how do you feel well, about that? Well, you know, domain? eminent domain is a, is a, is a tricky um, concept to, to, you know, we, we should consider it. You know, the eminent domain is only supposed to exist for infrastructure projects that benefit the community. Uh, unfortunately, eminent domain is actually being used all across the country right now to take people's land for a pipeline. So not only are they losing a chunk of their land, their land is being put at risk of pollution, and they have no say in it. Um, so I feel like we, you know, there's there's really two arguments within this eminent domain understanding. Um, we recognize that we live in a society and that we need to work together to benefit the whole because that's the only way we truly succeed as individuals is if our whole community succeeds. Um, so infrastructure projects are important and eminent domain um, exists for a good reason. But there should be a legal remedy for people such as yourself who disagree with the claim that somehow the state just has automatic authority over your land. Now, there are legal avenues people can go down. But it seems to me that perhaps you run yourself into a difficult quandary here where you're saying that the government should have all this power when it agrees with you, but when it doesn't agree with you, it shouldn't have that power. No. You're like, eminent domain's okay when it has the same ideas as I do. Well, I, I didn't qualify it uh, agreeing or disagreeing. Um, I, I recognize the, the reason it exists, and I recognize some of the benefits of it. Um, but I also recognize the rights of the individual, and those rights are quickly being diminished in this present one one of the tenets of eminent domain is is that the, the whoever the entity is can't just come in and seize your land. You have to be justly compensated for it. Absolutely right. And, and so I, I I don't hear you including that. Well, in, that's in, already but, there. I mean, everyone assumes that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, you I know, mean, it, it is. It's part of every every state and federal law. Yeah, you have to be yeah. justly compensated. Yeah. The only time you get in trouble is like when Missoula tries to take that guy's house on South Avenue and doesn't pay him for it. And, and, and then they get sued and, and lose. Yeah. And, and yeah. then they yeah. take it back to court again and they get so. sued and lose. And then take it back to court again because they love <laughs> their public so much and then they lose again. Yeah. Good anyway. job, city of but Missoula. It, but anyway, and, and that is exactly the, the point of why we um, are getting involved. Uh, you know, these are prime examples of the people feeling like they're not represented within their government. And of course, they're not represented. You know, business and industry, they are represented very well. And you can look at the laws passed and the, the benefits afforded to them in this country, and you can see that they're very well represented. But I know a lot of working class families who are struggling to buy enough food for their family, um, being choice to, uh, forced to choose between rent and food. The, they don't feel like they're being represented. Um, and, and that's just one slice of the population but, but, that doesn't but, but, feel like they're but being represented. It, isn't, that the, isn't that the eternal condition though of 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 any society there are always going to be people who are rich there are always going to be people who are poor wouldn't it be nice if 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 the rich people could voluntarily say hey let's just i'll share everything i got with you guys we all come out somewhere even unfortunately human nature doesn't work like that and so we put together uh, laws and governments to try to you know make things as just as possible it doesn't always work out that way but you know, who, who was it that said democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others? I, know. I believe it was Churchill. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway. Well, you know, I mean, um, there are rich and there are poor, um, but we should never allow the rich to have more say than the poor. You know, that is counter to this idea of democracy that we have. Um, and we are a republic. You know, we, we have a representative democracy, not a direct democracy, which means that the people we send – have got to they have to speak for all of us. To speak for all of us, but we're not getting that right now. We we get our representatives speaking, if not solely, mostly for business entities and corporate interests, because that's where the money's at. That's their donors. Um, it's very expensive to run a party uh, or a campaign in this in this country, and that forces out the little guy and. We're wanting to bring the little guy back into the fight and back into the picture. Okay, we're going we're to come right back. We're up against a break. Jerry, Bobby, and John all want to visit with you. We have one line open. And uh, Thomas Breck joining us here is the candidate, Green Party, a candidate for Congress. We're coming right back. This is Talk Back, and it's Wednesday. And uh, I'm Peter Christian. That's John King over there. We have Thomas Breck joining us here in the studio. Uh, go ahead, John. Oh, I was going to read from the Montana Constitution. Right? Yeah. We were talking earlier on about Montana versus the the federal government on taking care of state lands. Sure. Uh, this is uh, Section 3 of Article 2. All persons are born free and have certain inalienable rights. They include the right to a clean and healthful environment and the rights of pursuing life's basic necessities, enjoying and defending their lives and liberties, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, 
and seeking their safety, health, and happiness in all lawful ways. In enjoying these rights, all persons recognize corresponding responsibilities. I don't know. I, it's probably better than you'll get from the federal government. <laughs> well, you know, probably. Uh, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, there's much of the water in Montana you can't drink right now. You can't drink the water in Butte. So there's already violations to our state constitution that exist within real time of our state. Um, and those threats are well, not going give away. Give a little bit of a break. They, they put the constitution, this one, in place in like 81, right? 1973. 19, sorry, 73. Yeah. yeah. Which was long after a lot of the problems in Butte had, had already begun. Yes. Uh, it, it was after the fact. So, okay, well, we, we have lots of folks that want to visit. Let's get on the phone and say good morning to Jerry. Jerry, thank you for holding, sir. You're on. Good morning. Uh, Thomas, uh, what is your position on sanctuary cities in our state? And is, if you were elected congressman, what would your position be on enforcing the federal law on, uh, on our state? Okay, thanks for the call. So what do you think? Sanctuary cities, uh, locally and nationally. Um, well, you know, sanctuary cities, um, I don't intrinsically have a problem with. You know, we uh, were an, are an immigrant country. Um, my, my family were all immigrants. Um, bless my mother, who was half native. Um, the real problem with the immigrant situation um, is the wars occurring across the globe. Um, on behest of us, the people, um, and these wars are the driver of these immigrants and these refugees. Um, no, there, there's and, a difference between immigrants. It's and true, refugees. but but I mean, everybody's okay. leaving their war-torn areas. Well, in is, an effort to is, 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 is Mexico a war a war-torn? If you area? look at the number of people who've been killed in the last couple of years to, because of the drug cartels, you could easily make that argument. All right. Um, that being said, we should probably, um, as well as addressing the symptoms of the problem, we should be addressing the drivers of the problem, and that is war. Fifty-four um, percent of all discretionary spending in this country goes to military, and Trump is wanting to increase that. You know, there's a trillion dollars a year that goes to war, and then we wonder why we have so many enemies. Um, we're driving uh, many of our problems with our behaviors. So, so you you don't believe in the, in the mantra of peace through strength? You don't believe that? Well, what is strength? Uh, maybe strength is re- is not attacking someone, you know. Uh, strength is, you know, not punching someone who's in your face yelling at you. You know, that's strength. It's not strong to, to, to hit someone or to add, lash out in violence. That's not strength. Strength is composing yourself and being a reasoned individual when the situation makes you not want to be. So okay. Pearl Harbor, day after, we you're just, there, you say, mm, we're not going to lash back. We dropped an atomic bomb on an island. I'm not saying we didn't. I'm saying you're saying we shouldn't. We should not have gone to war with uh, with that. No, we shouldn't have lashed out. Now, now, responding to someone is not the same thing as lashing out. When we dropped a atomic bomb, that was a lash out. But we could throw men's lives away on the islands all the way to Japan and then invade Tokyo. That would be not lashing out. It would be over a, a, a conservative estimate. Not the over, same over, as over a million people would have died. Not the same as what we have facing us today. Okay. Not, the wars were totally different. It was a different world let's, back then. Let's, let's, let's move on to the next question. Bobby, you're on Talkback. Thanks for holding. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, first off, I think if you're running for office, it's supposed to be a free country. I don't think two parties should be able to dictate who gets to run. Thanks, sir. Then on another thing, you brought up the, ch- the, the subject of hemp to make fuel. There's a guy, and his name is David Bloom. He wrote a book called Alcohol Can Be a Gas. I believe he is or was a professor at Berkeley. And he goes all over the world giving speaking, uh, speaking to people about how to make alcohol fuel, which is completely clean. You can spill it in the water. It just dissipates. Uh, race cars drive on alcohol fuel. And you can make it out of just about anything. So um, this guy puts forth his theory in his book. His phone number and his website's in there. You can get a hold of him, and he's happy to talk to anybody. And... Alcohol fuel is a great thing, and he said when Obama got in office, he said, "Well, now we got some people that we can work with." Well, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even see him. Wrong. They just they were not interested. <laughs> Why at am all. I not surprised? Uh, well, thank there's you. not a lot of money, and it. it's cheap. Thanks for your call, Bobby. Your call okay, was thanks. also a gas. Um, well, and I would I would add to that, Bobby, that um, Henry Ford actually designed and uh, created a Model T that was um, built of hemp plastic that's 20 times denser than steel and ran on hemp bio uh, fuel or um, uh, hemp ethanol 
primarily, there were other uh, vegetable celluloses in there. I'd like to read and this about was in that. the 50s. This it's, was in the 50s, and the government banned him. He said he could be up and mass producing it in under a year, and the federal government banned him from doing it, saying it would have a negative impact on the economy. But if we look you know, forward. So, so is that is that the real reefer madness then, or what? Well, I mean, the the that that you know, reefer and hemp are two different things. Yeah, I know. You know, know, um, know and a lot of people conflate the two. As soon as you start talking hemp, they start talking weed. Ding ding ding. Hemp ding, ding, and right, weed yeah, are right. two different things. Right. Right now, Canada is producing hemp that produces less than one percent of THC per cubic ton. Well, let, let me tell you, if you if you have a Ford pickup truck that was uh, that was manufactured in the 70s or 80s, chances are the cloth you're sitting on is hemp. It's true. Yeah. Our so. independence, uh, Declaration of Independence was written on hemp. Our first flag as a country was written um, on uh, was created from hemp fibers and all of our revolutionary soldiers wore homespun hemp clothing. You know, hemp was the textile fabric of the 18th century and 19th century and it wasn't until Petroleum was able to synthesize the properties of hemp oil that we stopped using hemp primarily. This joint needs to pass to our commercial break. <laughs> so. Punny, punny, punny. My goodness, John. That's my job to make the bad joke. I don't yeah. want to blow smoke in your job. No, that was a punny joke. <laughs> I, I, want, I want you to have the, have take control. I, yeah, I do, you feel, we'll, do you feel like you're able to take control? I think we'll, uh, I think we'll talk, I mean, take a break. <laughs> right, now, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, we're back on Talk Back, 721-1290 is the number, and that's John King over there. I'm Peter Christian, Thomas Breck joining us. Go ahead, John. Okay, well, last question before I'm, and I'm done. All right. <laughs> uh, I doubt that. I, I want to hear I want to hear your take on the whole spoiler argument, because it seems to me right now Democrats in Montana are very scared of seeing your name on the ballot. They are afraid that you will strip votes away from Mr. Quist and that you will foil attempts for them to gain a foothold in Congress. And I, I do you think that that's a... Is that what you perceive? I'm just saying this from the outside. I don't. I don't work for the Democratic Party, it, it, but it if, seems to me that that seems to be the, it, the, the 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 lens through which they view you. If the Democrats lose, it's because of their own fault. They they have made their bed and they're going to have to lay in it. Um, I want Democrats to vote for the guy that they feel is the best man for the job, candidate for the job. I, ex- I expect Republicans to vote for the person that they best think will do the job, and I want to. Provide everyone else, which, I mean, in 2016, there was nearly 300,000, 287,480 Montana and eligible voters who did not vote. Do you think that high-profile Democrats will switch to vote for you? I do. I do. I, I, I personally know of a couple. I remember, you know, I won't throw their names out there because oh, that, would, on, that would not be nice. But oh. – but, <laughs> there are. I, I know of. Now, you Democrats. did tell a reporter off air some names. Yes, I did. And yes, so are I you did. saying I can't and I can go t- back and, and use I can, that? And I can tell you that um, at the Democratic National or State Convention, when Amanda Curtis did not get the nomination, I had uh, more than a half a dozen people call me and say, I'm in on your campaign. And the only thing that they were waiting for was whether or not they were going to let the progressive have the nomination or whether they were going to prop up. Uh, Quasi celebrity, instead. And Wait, are you calling Quist a quasi celebrity? I am. He's he's a Mission Mountain band. You know, uh, he's been on the Arts Council, but I wouldn't say that he's a politician or even studies politics. Well, it, it sounds to me like you don't like politicians. You're a grassroots kind of guy. So what, what's not to like about Mr. Quist? I don't dislike. Speaking Mr. of Quist. grass, I, and I, I, prior I have conversation. no problem with Mr. <laughs> Quist. My problem is with the Democratic National Party and their power over their candidates. Okay, let's, right. let's move on. Let's move on. All right, we lost John, but Marilyn is still there. Uh, Marilyn, you're on. Go ahead. Oh, um, okay. So I have two quick questions. Um, people, planet, peace is your um, mantra or whatever. So first question. Yeah, I call you, it a slogan. You know. Slogan. Yeah, okay. There you go. So first question is, do you believe an unborn baby is a person? Okay, next question. Well, let's, let's get his answer. Okay. Go ahead. Well, an unborn baby child um that is much like making the argument that um an have, acorn you, is you have three kids i do have three yeah. children and and i'm you know i love children i love life um but we should you know a woman a woman's right to choose what to do with her body is her right and her prerogative um calling a potential acorn an oak tree is not the same thing right? a potentiality is not the same thing as an actuality so until that child is actually born we don't know that there it won't be a stillborn. It won't have uh, health complications that may reduce or even d- 
diminishes possibilities for life. So we should always be mindful of that an actuality and a potentiality are two different things. Um, and until uh-huh. a potentiality becomes an actuality, we shouldn't consider it an actuality. You, you, you just lost me on that one. So, so I lost that, you on that he, one. He's saying that things that – well, and I, I, I disagree. I think we need to judge people especially on their potential. You should treat people, especially handicapped people, um, and try to give them as, as much a potential possibility as they can. And the same should go for our unborn. Why don't we judge the value of people based on their potential? As a philosophy, that seems to be the more humanitarian way to do it. But we're not talking about the potential of a person. You aren't. We're talking about the potential of life. Because we disagree about life. We're talking about the potential, potential of life. Because okay. that baby has DNA that's So unique. I will say this. Um, my middle daughter uh, was a high-risk pregnancy, and we had to at least consider um, options that, that we didn't want to discuss, me and my wife, uh, when we were dealing with the possibility of birth defects and a number of other things that I won't go into detail today. Mm. Um, I've had to sit in that moment and decide what was going to be best for my young family. The state should never come into that decision between me and my wife about what we should do for our family or what my wife should possibly have to do for her own family. You know, if, if a single mother, you know, I, I, I don't think that in that now you realize tremendously even, tough situation. Even with Roe v. Wade, even under our current laws and all that, the state still steps in and comes into that conversation. At a certain, it, point, it in the, at, at a certain point in the decision-making process, it says you can't have an abortion. Um, there's timelines, but the ultimate decision rests with the woman – um, and, and, and should, um, you know, families who have forced these type of decisions, um, they are uh, in a very, very tough spot usually when they're considering these things. And the weight of that situation is heavy enough without adding in further burdens. Uh, in, in my opinion, the emphasis should be on the child. But but that's that's just me. We so, should we should get back to. She yeah. had three questions. What was Marilyn, your next question? You go, Marilyn. What's what's your no, second question? I just question? had one other question. Okay. Um, do you believe that the content of a person's character is more important than their skin color or gender? Absolutely. Okay, Good. Marilyn. So you're not into this identity politics coalition stuff that the Democrats. Well, are in? so as it was explained to me, thanks, thanks, um, the 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 people that are wanting to do away with identity politics, as it was pointed out to me, are typically white men. Uh, being how I'm a white man, I'm I'm <laughs> He's a apprehensive. <laughs> I'm I'm apprehensive about um, removing identity politics um, from the equation or from the conversation. Um, you know, we all have a story. We all have a culture from where we come from, and those are tremendously important to our self identity. And we shouldn't be removing that self identity from the political equation. Okay. And with that, we're going to take a one-minute break. And, Sue, I'm so glad you called, Sue. I was expecting you. We're going to come right back uh, with uh, with more of Talk Back. Uh, if you want to talk with Thomas Breck, we only have eight minutes left in the program. So 721-1290 is our number. All right. We're back on Talk Back. There you go. That's John King. I'm Peter Christian. Joining us in the studio, Thomas Breck. And, uh, of course, he's the uh, Green Party candidate for Congress. And let's get right back to the phone. And Sue, good morning. I was hoping you'd call. Go ahead. <laughs> good morning. What's up? Well, Mr. Quist may not be a politician, but he knows how to build, he knows how to get the votes. And he went to Eastern Montana and um, got at least seven uh, Democratic uh, precincts or central committees up and running. And that's why he won, because he got those votes. So. He may not be a politician, but he knows how to get votes. Also, he was friends with Mr. Schweitzer, which I hear had a lot to do with it. Well, that didn't hurt that Mr. Schweitzer didn't go across the state and, and build those. Uh, so, those so so what um, you're saying is is it is that Mr. Quist is a coalition builder. Is that right? He is. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, I would say Thanks. that, you know, I don't have a problem with, with uh, Rob Quist. You know, he seems like a really great guy, and, and I wasn't meaning to diminish his character or his quality of, you know, the, the type of candidate he would be. Um, this really isn't about Quist. Uh, for me, this is about the nearly 300,000 Montana voters who have disengaged the system, who are not participating and don't feel like there is any representation for them within it. Um, and so for me, I'm not, I'm not out to attack the Democrats or the Republicans or the Libertarians. You know, I, I want everybody to have a say and for the stronger candidate to win. Um, we should have an in, in, inclusive system 
of democracy and not an exclusive system of democracy. And that's what I'm fighting for. So speaking of inclusivity, are you with all the other candidates? Do you have state tax liens uh, against you at all? No, I have no state tax liens. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we do have some questions on Facebook. I'll go through these. Uh, Thomas says, uh, uh, Daniel says, Thomas just spoke of the burden of taxes and property owners. Does he really think people who do not own property are somehow immune to tax burden? Renters pay tax indirectly via rent. Everyone is taxed on their vehicles, not to mention state income tax. Consumers on the whole share of the tax burden in the price of goods and services. I guess it's not really a question, so I'm going to move on. Um, can you, uh, Elena wants you to um, outline the main duty of the federal government in your own words. Well, government exists to help us, the people, have a working and productive society. And I don't feel like the federal government has been doing that as of late. Um, there's many people in our country who are doing without the basic necessities. And, you know, we came together under this guise of a social contract that we would all be better off together than separate. But if people are doing without, that, that means that they're not better off. So what benefit do they have to contribute to a system that has left them out. So is is your problem the the idea of capitalism or is it the fact that capitalists uh, or capitalism by its very nature makes people greedy for more? Well, capitalism isn't in and of itself bad, but we have a social safety net for a reason and that's a really good counterbalance to capitalism is a bit of socialism. And we are quickly losing that socialism. You know, the social security is being you know under attack they want to privatize it. Um, By the way, that line has been thrown out in political conversations for 40 years. It's true. It's true. But it's, it's, so, there it's is, going away. Freak well, out. And I'm not saying it's going away. I'm saying that these social safety nets that we have as a country that have allowed us to prosper and become the country we are are being threatened. And capitalism, it, you know, we, we have seen a decline in unions, which has been inversely uh, the number of corporations and the power of corporations in the public sphere. Well, <laughs> If you want to talk about unions, unions uh, in many ways caused their own death. It, it, absolutely. Because of the greed and corruption that existed within the unions. Um, before we run out of time, one more Facebook question. Yeah, we have three three minutes. Okay, this is from Paul. He says, how do you differ from Quist and Gianforte? And which causes of yours do each of them support? I mean, there must be some overlap, right? Or no? You totally Yeah, I'm not really – you know, I, I – I haven't looked at them to say, well, they, they align with me in this area or they align with, with me in that area. Um, I, I really – I try not to talk about them. I mean I have the, a bit more this morning than I have in any interview or discussion previous because this isn't about them. This is about the, the hundreds of thousands of Montanans who are disengaged and are left out of the process. Yeah, let me ask you this. Why – we have a very large audience listening to us today. So I'm, you're on your stump, okay? Why should people vote for Thomas Breck? even if you're not on the ballot, just as a write-in. Why, why, why? The reason that uh, Montana should vote for me is because I have no corporate master. We don't take corporate money. I would be uh, beholden to only the people of Montana. I wish to listen to them and then to be a vessel for their um, what they perceive as important. Um, I'm not here to prescribe what will fix people's lives. I'm here to listen to what they think will fix their lives and then to work really, really hard to accomplish that. Now, do you think that you would, if, let's say you were elected, okay, you would be, how many how many people in the Green Party are in Congress, do you know? We have no Green Party members in okay. Congress, well, never then, have. Then we yeah, do have Kenneth Mejia, who is uh, running a Southern California campaign, right. who is, his election's on the 4th, and he's running a really strong campaign, and it looks like he could win. What I'm saying, what I'm saying to you is, you would be the Lone Ranger, if you will, <laughs> the Lone Green Ranger in lone Congress. Ranger. And, and, and would you be able to get anything done? I mean, would you be able to find any sort of... Uh, any, any agreement? Well, Bernie Sanders is a lone ranger as well, and he's gotten some things done, and he's inspired a whole generation to become involved in politics who otherwise were sitting out. So, and the, uh, but, but the reason is, is because he was treated so badly. I think that's one of the reasons why people, in, in, the, in the sense of well, fair play... He was a senator long before he was... Well, and I've yeah. been following Bernie Sanders for 10 years. You know, I've been listening to him long before I ever actually became involved and, you know, before he made that jump to the Democratic so, Party. If, if you will, Bernie Sanders was a victim. Absolutely. Okay. So. A really important radio question, though. So I might need Jesse Jeff Westchester to step in here, but <laughs> will you use a raspy male country voice for any of your radio ads? Yeah. Uh, this, this, this is Thomas. I, I, don't, I don't think I can. This is Thomas. No, you, you just, <laughs> I, I can you, try. You just hire me. Okay, Big hat. 
Big, since, I, since I quit smoking, the, the raspiness has gone away. Thomas French <laughs> is a real Montanan, and he'll stand up for you. Oh, yeah. that's a, I don't know. Are you a real Montanan? Were you, like, dug out of the earth here, or did you... <laughs> Um, did you come from some other state? No, no. Um, I, I came here for college for my for my wife, and um, now we've both graduated from the University of Montana. Two of my three children were born here. Um, my wife and my oldest daughter were actually born of the same doctor. You came in two thousand nine. Um, you know, they were born of the same doctor in two thousand four in, in Haley, Idaho. Uh, right. My my wife and my oldest daughter, and then my two uh, my middle and my youngest daughter were both born to um, Doctor Montgomery. And we are, we are flat out of time. Uh, if folks want to uh, uh, donate or contribute, what do they do? Um, Thomas Breck for Congress us is my website. Okay. You can also find me Thomas Breck for Congress on Facebook. Okay, and we're out of time. Thank you, Thomas. It's a pleasure. And Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow morning on Talkback, everybody.